This lecture is going to be based uh, on my recent research, uh, out of which I also wrote a monograph, and it is the early modern medical landscape uh, of one particular part of Hungary. This is the southwestern part of Hungary. And uh, out of this uh, uh, medical landscape, now I am going to highlight uh, the sphere of the popular healers and the sphere of popular healing. So in the beginning, let me just read out a story because I am a folklorist, not only an anthropologist, and I'm also working with people's stories. So uh, in the year of 1736 on a Saturday, young Margit Nusser, the wife of Christian Packer, suddenly fell ill and died in terrible torments on Sunday. To the eyewitnesses' astonishment, her body turned entirely black as if it was beaten. The rumor started almost immediately in the village that the untimely death of the young and healthy Margit was unnatural and must have been caused by certain witchy mastery. A week before Margit's death, Mrs. Pinter, a neighbor of hers, sought heaven and earth for her daughter's missing shirt. When she couldn't find it, she suspected that the shirt must, might have been stolen. As it was customary that time, she publicly threatened the still hiding thief by announcing her suspicions to her neighbors. My daughter's shirt is missing, but the one who took it away must bring it back soon. One night soon after this announcement, the neighbors were woke up by the rattling and moaning of countless cats heard from Mrs. Pinter's courtyard. They understood of the mess and noise that Mrs. Pinter was indeed committed to get the missing shirt back and she must have used some magic for her purposes. In fact, they were right. She told one of her neighbors that she was about to carry out a commonly known magical ritual to force the thief to return the stolen item. So she went to the water mill several times and secretly took some pieces of white linen clothes there. Her intention was to throw the rags into the running water under the wheel of the water mill. According to common belief, by this action, one could send the cold shivers onto someone. Her accomplice, the miller journeyman's wife, was just looking for the right moment to let her into the mill, which was otherwise a forbidden place for all but the miller himself. After several attempts, Mrs. Pinter had successfully implemented her magical act and left. But the miller noticed her leaving the water mill and questioned the journeyman's wife. Just she conf Press the next slide. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, she confessed him all. If the shirt has been uh, recovered, Mrs. Pinter would have stopped at that point, but the damned thief was still hiding and it made her a play for a more risky game. As she revealed it to one of her neighbors, this act of mine was useless, but the wife of the miller's apprentice will start a different dance now. She also told her that they managed to get six coffin nails from the blacksmith and they would hit them one by one into the wheel of the water mill. And at each hit, they would say, since you do not want to bring this shirt back in the name of the devil, I hit you in the name of the same devil to hit by thunder. So they did it on Friday night. By Sunday, Margit Nusser was dead. Both women panicked and they confessed their evil deed to the neighbors almost immediately. I wish she hadn't hit the last nail into the upper part of the wheel because it penetrated her brain and killed her, said Mrs. Pinter. What is more, the soul of the dead woman was heard crying in the water mill until the miller, until the miller pulled the last nail out of the top of the wheel. He was horrified by saying that blood was still dripping from the tip. At this very moment, the soul prayed to God and disappeared. Mrs. von Pinter was arrested and detained in the county jail. She was accused of witchcraft and sentenced to torture to extract a detailed confession. However, as she insisted on her being innocent in killing Margit Nusser, she had to endure only three grades of the torture and her life was spared. Just to give you some impression where it happened, the water mill is still there, even ruined, and 
the wheel from a neighboring and still working water mill is seen. So we can have an impression that where this all act took place and how it happened. So what is interesting for us and what are the most interesting things in this story? So there are two witches and the devil involved. There is illness caused by witchcraft and a ghost also appears. So it's a nice, pretty story. Somewhere from the Transdanubian area, uh, it is just exactly from this place, from this very place. And this is the very place where I did my inquiry as well. So you can see here, this is the attraction area of one Marian shrine where all these witch trial documents are stemming from. The Marian shrine is right here where you can see the star. And these are all the territories where I gathered the trial documents to my inquiry. So uh, if we see that what was uh, the density of trials uh, in, uh, uh, in the historical Hungary, you can see that approximately the same area is not so densely covered by trials, but uh, there are some uh, texts uh, and documents still remained. So what is different compared to the general view on witchcraft, that witchcraft was not a medieval phenomenon. Witch trials uh, were quite of uh, quite uh, not rare but uh, they happened quite often even in the 17th century and even more in the 18th century in Hungary. Uh, you can see that the darker the spots are the more trials are stemming from, from uh, one particular district or region. You can also see that here is the peak of the trials and it is exactly the 18th century and not the trial, not uh, the period before. Of course, it is uh, also, it can also be attributed to the, uh, uh, to the lack of uh, sources. But uh, anyway, the tendency is, uh, even if we had more sources, the tendency would be quite similar to this. So I have chosen a period where there are quite many which trial documents from one uh, particular region. And this was the uh, attraction area of Van Marian Shrine. And you can see that uh, in, my, uh, in my survey, uh, I checked this period of time. And in the peaking period, I also have more than 40 trials uh, uh, within one decade from this area. Uh, I, <laughs> I also inquired uh, uh, some other parts of Hungary just to make a, a comparison and just to test the method that how can I try, uh, how can I, I make, uh, how can I draw the magical landscape of one particular early modern uh, territory. And I have chosen uh, one uh, Transylvanian uh, uh, town called Bajamare today, which is in Hungarian Nagybanya, and I have already tested this method. Uh, this is the landscape uh, of Nagybanya, just shortly. So what I wanted to know, it is not particular that how witchcraft uh, uh, acted or how witchcraft was carried out in this region, but how uh, this medical landscape uh, was composed, what were the parts of it? Uh, I also called it, uh, 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 um, with another metaphor, I called it a medical marketplace. Not a medical market because uh, it was not a market economy at that time. But the marketplace was uh, the very site where many ideas and many people could meet. And also there was a market for uh, the healing services and the magical services available. And the witch trial documents are rather rich sources. Uh, out, of, uh, out of them, one can excavate uh, lots of information uh, regarding to the healing and the magical practices. 
And these sources are also valuable because they, uh, they reveal us that how the different ways and the different traditions and the different knowledges on healing competed at these uh, metaphorical marketplaces. So I also used different approaches uh, to, to map these medical landscapes. And uh, one of these approaches was the approach of medical anthropology. And medical anthropology operates with different medical systems. Uh, medical systems are complex cultural systems. They consist of uh, not only the knowledge on healing and medicine and health and uh, itself, but also uh, the different sources where this knowledge is stemming from and also that how, how the people relate to this knowledge, how they acquire it and how, how this knowledge is applied. So uh, it is uh, basically an accepted uh, view that these medical systems in complex societies exist uh, by one another and they also communicate, they interact with, with each other. They do not exist uh, as closed systems. They are open systems and there are, the boundaries are rather fluid between them. So uh, I will return to this uh, medical system topic, but uh, let me follow my inquiry. Uh, as an anthropologist I, and or a folklorist, uh, one deals with people and one uh, is doing fieldwork, but uh, within a, a historical environment, one just cannot go to people and ask them. One cannot make interviews, one cannot make fieldwork because it is impossible, but one should then create or somehow reconstruct uh, uh, or uh, this uh, environment and uh, to reach the people's voice and what they might have said or, or might have thought, one should use the historical sources. Because I was interested in the bottom-up perspective that how these medical systems operated according to the people's experiences, to the people's imaginations, how these different uh, thoughts were mingled and how uh, the situation of illness as a crisis situation was handled. So I also chose not a huge uh, uh, macro uh, scale of, uh, to this inquiry, but uh, rather the micro social scale. So I was interested in that how within households and how within small communities, these different kinds of medical knowledges uh, lived by one another. And in a situation of crisis, which, uh, um, which methods were applied. And of course, I was interested in that how these events are narrated. What is the language which is used to this? And how can I have access to all of these sources? So of course, I had to treat my sources very critically. And I had to, uh, uh, I had to consider uh, all the circumstances out of which these sources are stemming from. So considering all these uh, um, um, not too advantageous uh, uh, circumstances, one, one could still somehow make a more or less complex picture on, on these medical landscapes. Uh, of course, this methodology was not my creation or my invention. Uh, David Gentilcourt, the Italian-American uh, uh, medical anthropologist and historian uh, had successfully applied this method when he mapped uh, the medical uh, landscape uh, of, uh, 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 the <coughs> of early modern Italy and especially uh, in the kingdom of Naples. Uh, and he also applied this medical pluralism model, uh, which was quite useful to my inquiry as well. As you can see here, there is a diagram which shows three circles uh, and uh, the different circles uh, describe or denote the different uh, spheres of healing and medicine. 
he called these spheres a popular sphere, uh, a clerical or ecclesiastical sphere, and a medical sphere. These spheres also describe the origin of knowledge and also the different kind of treatments what are applied and also uh, the social uh, uh, stance of uh, those who are involved in the, in the healing process. So uh, the healing practitioners uh, themselves. What he uh, also uh, realized during his inquiry that uh, these spheres are uh, uh, intermediating, they are in, in a complex uh, um, relationship and they also are in a, in a certain kind of uh, common interaction with each other. So in a, neither situations and in neither cases what he examined, one could uh, very clearly distinguish uh, that uh, in this situation only one and uh, only and one and the uh, uh, sole uh, part of uh, the medical knowledge uh, was uh, applied. So it is basically a, a kind of ethic, so not an innate uh, creation, an analytical tool, this diagram and this medical sphere uh, scheme. One should uh, see that they never exist in themselves. So it is uh, much more uh, uh, a good tool when one would like to uh, analyze and uh, to understand that how, um, how they uh, lived uh, by one another. But uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, one, should, uh, one should also bear in mind that uh, that uh, they are inseparable uh, from each other. And this is uh, why I prefer talking about the medical landscape and not the different systems uh, of medicine, because uh, this is not uh, an emic uh, description of the situation. But in a landscape, one can see several uh, objects and uh, it depends on the perspective out of which one sees this landscape and uh, whether one is inside the landscape or above it, that how one perceives it. So uh, let me just uh, recall two other <laughs> helpers uh, of mine, two books, and they were both uh, compiled by or written by Arthur Kleinman, who was a uh, uh, a psychologist and uh, and also a psychiatrist and uh, who just drew my attention and also the medical anthropologist's attention to uh, the very fact that one can learn how illness is experienced only through the patient's narratives. One should, uh, I mean, a, do a good doctor should always ask the patients that how they feel and how they perceive their illness. And this is what is uh, uh, what can be really helpful and what should be incorporated into any kind of treatment. So Arthur Kleiman uh, meant his thoughts to uh, practicing uh, physicians and doctors, but uh, his uh, thoughts and his ideas uh, were uh, very much based on those uh, medical um, uh, medical systems which are not uh, the European biomedical um, 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 medical systems, but uh, uh, one might describe them as uh, tribal medical systems or, uh, or not European or not Western European uh, medical systems where uh, illness is explained and, uh, and perceived rather differently. And this was what the medical anthropologists uh, uh, had to face when they were interested in that, uh, how healing and how medicine works uh, in different cultures. And uh, this perspective was brought into the clinical practice and uh, also uh, uh, into the medical anthropological uh, um, um, methodology as well. So in my inquiry, 
I, I have uh, also made a great use of uh, uh, of this uh, this perspective by uh, Arthur Kleiman. So, what I thought would be really useful uh, in my case is to analyze that how then illness is narrated in the witch trial documents, and uh, one basic. Um, uh, point of mine was that I realized that uh, bewitchment is basically uh, one of the chief uh, causes of illness and uh, one of the chief explanations of illness. So uh, the stories on bewitchment are basically narratives on illness, that how one got this or that symptoms. Uh, the structural morphological uh, analysis of uh, bewitchment stories, which uh, was based on uh, Vladimir Propp's uh, morphological uh, analysis of the folktale, uh, highlighted uh, some key uh, elements um, and uh, also uh, the different uh, composition of this element. element uh, constituted uh, different types uh, or different, stru uh, different structures of narratives. But these basic key elements uh, can be found in almost all of these uh, bewitchment stories or illness narratives in the witch trials. Uh, I do not want to, uh, to elaborate now that how these uh, categories uh, were, uh, uh, were created. Uh, uh, in this respect, uh, uh, I, I built, um, built on, uh, on the research uh, by uh, Eva Poch and Gabor Klonitsai, who uh, used this uh, structural morphological analysis to, to describe and to understand that how uh, bewitchment was narrated and what were the key uh, figures and the key factors uh, and how, uh, how these uh, bewitchment stories and bewitchment cases were built up. Um, so th these are the key elements in, uh, uh, in these uh, stories. And if you remember to the first story, what I read out, uh, some of these key elements uh, uh, turned up, uh, turned up uh, uh, in the story. And uh, let me now just uh, to refer uh, uh, to, an, uh, to another uh, story. This is a story which originates from the 1713 uh, trial. And uh, uh, the midwife uh, about whom this story is told is a 70 year old widow. And she's called Baba Kota or Midwife Kota. And uh, in this case, um, uh, she, um, what, what the story, what is told about her is uh, uh, just, uh, it contains uh, these elements, these uh, uh, very important uh, morphological elements that, uh, that I was uh, just referred to. So, Soon after that she had a quarrel with the old midwife, many dangerous ulcers and ringworms appeared on her, uh, on, uh, on her unmarried daughter. So this is about a quarrel about two women. Uh, in vain did she beg to midwife Kata. She refused to treat the girl. While she was asking her, midwife Kata cursed herself, saying, I wish I was struck by a thunderbolt if I healed her. The desperate mother could but entrust the other healer woman who turned up there because she had been informed of the girl's dangerous malady. She stressed, however, that she could only heal the girl if God allowed it. Babakata, who was reluctant to take up the treatment, changed her mind and got offended that the mother refused her services. Thus, while she was leaving, Mrs. Ila, uh, Ila, Ila's <coughs> Mrs. Ila's house, she gave something threat some threatening words to the healer woman. Just treat her then, but if I could, I made her ulcers as big as my fist. Later, the healer woman prepared a bath for the sick maiden. 
But as soon as she immersed in the tube, she started to cry out, take me out immediately, otherwise the midwife and her daughter will drown me in the, in the water. Although the testimony ends at this point without the mother revealing her sick daughter's fate, this case highlights at the process as an ordinary story on healing turns into a bewitchment narrative in the context of a witchcraft accusation. The competing healers were given the opposite roles and were reinterpreted as malevolent witch and benevolent counter witch. Consequently, the healing bath turned into a special divinatory method of summoning the perpetrator, that is the witch, him or herself, as the only way to repair the damage the witch had caused was to identify and then force him or her to withdraw the harmful magic. So in this story, we could see the previous elements that I enlisted. So here you can see that there is a conflict. A woman and the midwife, midwife were quarreling. And as a consequence, uh, some illness appears, very visible uh, symptoms appear. Uh, and then the midwife first refuses the cure. And then uh, when the other healer says that, okay, I will heal her, then the midwife sends further uh, 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 threats and, and an even more dangerous uh, situation appears. And uh, it is here uh, uh, very obviously said that uh, the <coughs> when, uh, when this uh, divinatory bath is, uh, is prepared, uh, then it immediately reveals that who was the real perpetrator. So in this situation, we can see at least two conflicts. One conflict between the mother and the old midwife, and another conflict between the two competing healers. I'm quite sure that uh, Professor Menz, I already uh, uh, explained during this course that uh, uh, there are different kinds of social tensions that are behind the accusations. But uh, here you could see that uh, these uh, <laughs> tensions uh, somehow uh, 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 peak out uh, in, a, in a rather sharp situation. Uh, on the other hand, this is a rather typical illness narrative. So here you can see that uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is something which is unex uh, unexplainable because there are some symptoms show, uh, showed up uh, uh, at a person's body. Nobody could uh, explain it. And uh, uh, the first uh, explanation at hand was a supernatural explanation that all these symptoms appeared because uh, the witch did something or a supernatural agent did something. And this is a, a core feature in this illness narratives that uh, the most important thing in every case in, uh, within this uh, early modern setting is that where the illness is coming from the explanation of the illness, illness is uh, uh, what is the most important. And only after, uh, uh, only after this, when uh, the cause is uh, found and identified, can one uh, start uh, the healing process. Uh, so this is uh, also uh, rather typical uh, in uh, those uh, societies and communities uh, uh, out of Europe where uh, not uh, the, the biomedical explanation and the biomedical logic uh, of healing uh, uh, exists or not only that exists. So this is something which uh, is obviously uh, not a characteristic uh, which is common or which was common even in the 18th uh, uh, century medical or official medical thinking. So uh, supernatural explanations of illness and witchcraft is one of the chief supernatural uh, explanation of illness or it was, uh, were not uh, 
were not entirely refused, of course, uh, uh, by trained uh, uh, the, uh, the trained medical person personnel in uh, in those uh, uh, in those years. But still, it was rather uh, uh, ra uh, or this was a time when uh, uh, when science uh, somehow uh, overcame these uh, explanations and uh, and tried to find some some other means to understand where uh, where the illness is coming from. So uh, on the one hand, we could see that according to the logic of healing, one of the uh, most important things was to find the cause of the illness and then uh, it uh, uh, designed uh, uh, the therapy already and on the other hand it is uh, just very interesting that if we accept that witchcraft is uh, something which can be a, a potential cause for illnesses then uh, all these stories on bewitchment which are enumerated in the witch trials are uh, these illness narratives and then uh, of course uh, they follow the logic of witchcraft as well so uh, in this sense uh, witchcraft is basically the chief reason uh, for uh, for illness we should bear in mind anyway that uh, uh, according to uh, the, the contemporary idea on, uh, on, uh, on witchcraft uh, and also according to the contemporary legislation uh, on witchcraft, witchcraft was uh, a similar cry, uh, crime like uh, theft or murder. So it was not a, a kind of supernatural crime, but it was uh, uh, judged uh, uh, according to the similar measures and not by ecclesiastical courts but by uh, by secular courts uh, uh, these trials uh, were brought uh, uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand uh, all these claims and and all these accusations were taken very seriously by the secular uh, by the secular courts as well so uh, even if uh, um, um, the, this uh, causation was a supernatural causation uh, they took it uh, absolutely real and absolutely seriously and uh, if someone said that uh, the witch sent me this illness and if someone could find uh, enough uh, uh, witnesses to, to support uh, uh, her, his or her claims then uh, <clears throat> then it was uh, it was just a, a legal course and it uh, and it and it was accepted so uh, let me return to the inquiry what i did because uh, i have not mentioned it yet that uh, within this period i examined uh, 144 uh, trials altogether and uh, almost 200 people were accused of witchcraft uh, uh, in this, uh, in the, uh, within this period, uh, but among them, there were only uh, twenty-four uh, who were uh, healers and or, or the expert uh, experts uh, on uh, whatever uh, uh, magical um, activity, like uh, divination, for example, and uh, there were thirty more people found who were. Uh, either uh, experts of magic or uh, experts of healing and among them one could find not only village healers or uh, cunning, uh, uh, cunning folk but uh, uh, physicians and barbers, midwives and uh, also uh, clerics like uh, preachers, friars or pilgrims. So uh, altogether these stories are uh, about healing and these uh, uh, these people these uh, 50, uh, 54 people uh, were those uh, who were visible uh, for me through the witch trial documents so here i also uh, just uh, collected that uh, who were these different uh, types of healers and what kind of uh, 
uh, denominations were used uh, in the trials. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I would highlight the cunning folk uh, in general. And uh, this terminology uh, regarding the cunning folk, uh, uh, if uh, we can make a short excursion in the, into the, the direction of etymology, one should see that among the cunning folk, one could find uh, the tudos or wise women or wise, uh, wise women. Uh, basically, it means that the one who knows something, who has the knowledge on something. And we can also find uh, uh, the healers, uh, which is called in Hungarian Orvos, uh, he is the one who heals or who cures someone. We find uh, another uh, specialist who is uh, a healer and a soothsayer at the very same time. And uh, when the et et etymology of this word was examined, it turned out that uh, basically this uh, word is stemming uh, from uh, the word good, which means you. And uh, this practitioner, if, if we try to translate this denomination, one may say that he is the or she is the one who turns things good or who makes good, who repairs something. And also he or she is the one who knows something uh, about the hidden or the unknown things uh, and uh, who is a soothsayer or diviner and who, who makes suggest, uh, suggestions considering the, the future, for example. Uh, we also find some who, uh, who has the ability to see uh, hidden or unknown things. So there are some seers involved. And also we find a particular magician uh, 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 who is called the Taltos, and, uh, and of course, there are midwives, uh, and uh, they are generally called Baba. Of course, some of these uh, um, denominations are, uh, uh, remained in the Latin version as well, because uh, these uh, trial documents are partly Hungarian pa and, uh, uh, and partly in Latin, because the, the language of the leg legislation was Latin. And, uh, um, Midwives are generally called uh, uh, obstetrices uh, in this uh, in these documents, but uh, never uh, the narrators or the witnesses call them obstetrics, uh, or they, they of course they do not use this this uh, Latin denominations. Um, from my point of view, it was also uh, very uh, interesting and very important that how people uh, imagine bewitchment and how they, uh, how they experienced it, how they uh, explained it. And I found that according to my data, bewitchment is somehow imagined as a cause of illness uh, related to, to the proximity to the witch, because uh, witches or uh, in, in general, uh, were imagined like uh, they have this particular uh, supernatural power or ability. And this supernatural power uh, had a certain kind of physical effect. So it was, uh, it was a, a real uh, sensation uh, very, uh, very often. So uh, people uh, had experiences when this supernatural power somehow afflicted them. So uh, on the one hand, uh, when uh, uh, they thought or they imagined that witches were able to send the illness on someone, witches can cause these symptoms from the distance. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, healing also worked uh, through the distant, uh, through the distance. So distant healing and distant bewitchment was rather common. So uh, one should even uh, one should not even meet the witch to 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 be struck by illness, and uh, there were quite many cases when the bewitchment is sent. If we remember, if we uh, we remember to to the first uh, story that I told, uh, and uh, this uh, magical. Uh, um, 
punishment of the thief uh, was about sending the cold shivers or the chills or fever to the thief. So it worked uh, on, on the basis of the sympathetic magic and uh, that uh, uh, as the, the small uh, things were thrown into the cold water and the cold water was running, so this cold should uh, reach also the thief. So uh, there are some other means, of course, that how uh, this bewitchment from the distance could work. But very often it was basically the ill will that was attributed to, uh, to the alleged witch, which caused this illness. So the witch didn't even have to do anything. Uh, she or he just sent out uh, uh, his or her ill will. And this ill will, this illness, this uh, ill power, this evil power could uh, um, could harm the uh, the people. Uh, a further uh, uh, physical sensation uh, uh, was that uh, uh, the witches could uh, stroke people by a certain kind of ill wind, and uh, even one of the illnesses was called uh, like seal uh, utesh, which means that hit by the wind. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, witches could also drag people into the whirlwind where, uh, where they were imagined uh, to fly. So this is something uh, which, is, uh, in, uh, which is connected to the wind, but these are basically two things. One is that there were also a very common uh, uh, belief that uh, the wind can bring several kind of evil things. There are several evil things flying in the wind and that there is this kind of bad air, uh, the miasma, uh, which might cause illness. And this was not uh, the belief of common people, but even learned physicians shared uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this idea that there are certain places where uh, the bad air inhabit. And this is one of the causes of, of the plague, for example. These evil places can be the places where the, the dead people are buried. And all these, uh, 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 the gas which uh, the, the rotten bodies uh, uh, blow into the air uh, could turn uh, into a kind of evil bad air. And this evil bad air can cause uh, a lot of uh, different kind of uh, illnesses. And it seems that uh, in, the, in the context of this 18th century uh, witch trials and in the context of these narratives, it seems that uh, uh, there was of course a belief that witches in general uh, fly in the air uh, invisibly. And there are many other uh, Supernatural, uh, supernatural beings flying in the air. And uh, on the other hand, there is this imagination on the ill wind, uh, which might bring uh, Ill, uh, illnesses about. So these uh, two ideas contaminated. And in these witch trials, uh, it is very often described that the, the witches sent this ill wind uh, uh, to, to the, onto the people. And uh, this is how they, they fell ill. Uh, this is still a, a kind of uh, uh, bewitchment from the distance, one may say, but uh, it is not like sending out the evil power, but there is already some kind of physical sensation uh, and a certain kind of uh, um, that the, the witch is somehow present in this ill, uh, ill or evil air. Uh, this is uh, in, included in this, uh, in this belief. Uh, thirdly, uh, it is also often described that the witch shot something into the patients or into the, into the human body, or uh, he or she sent out uh, the illness uh, by, uh, by an arrow, for example. And uh, of course, this, uh, this idea or this belief uh, had antecedents even in the antiquity. So uh, there are uh, different kinds of ancient gods uh, sending out uh, their, uh, 
their arrows like uh, Apollo, for example, and, uh, and uh, this is the cause of uh, contagious illnesses, or it, it, is it was basically imagined that these anti-gods uh, just uh, uh, took one's, uh, someone's life because they, they just uh, shot them. And on the other hand, uh, not only witches, but other supernatural uh, beings like fairies were attributed with this uh, ability that uh, they, uh, they shot people and uh, they uh, somehow inject a certain kind of illnesses into the human body. So uh, this idea is uh, 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 also appeared uh, uh, in the different kind of imaginations connected to uh, possession, that uh, when the, the devil or a certain kind of evil spirit uh, po uh, po uh, uh, is inside the human body, then this spirit uh, uh, might have uh, been uh, injected into this uh, uh, into the human body. But anyway, uh, this explanation had a long life, and even from the from the end of the period which I examined, I also found uh, from the 1790s uh, one uh, trial against, uh, against a healer. And, and in this trial, it was also said that he injected several things into, into the knees of a woman. And uh, when other physicians examined the knees of, uh, of this uh, sick woman, they found several items uh, inside her knees, like uh, pieces of rags and pieces of hair and stones and whatever. Uh, but let's turn, the, turn back to, to the list and how the witch is approaching toward the, towards uh, the human body. Uh, the witch may also touch the, the human uh, body or uh, to touch uh, the victim. And on the victim's body, one could see uh, the, the fingerprints, for example, uh, or, or of, these, uh, or of the witch, or uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, different kind of uh, skin uh, lesions or uh, uh, symptoms on the human skins are explained, and uh, that uh, these are the spots uh, uh, where the witches uh, touched you. Uh, but the, the same belief is also or was also connected to the fairies that different kind of uh, uh, red uh, spots or, or other um, uh, skin diseases uh, were caused by the fairies because uh, uh, someone was uh, <coughs> or touched, uh, someone was touched uh, uh, by the fairies or, uh, or, the, or for example, the witch spit uh, spitted uh, the saliva on someone and then uh, one's body turned red. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the, witch, uh, the witch's touch is not only a touch, but the witches may were, or, uh, were imagined that they were able to penetrate into the human body and they could even uh, make um, carry out different kinds of operations like real physicians on the human body. So they could extract uh, uh, the human uh, heart or they uh, could extract uh, uh, they could extract one's bone. Let's see some uh, stories on this. Um, so uh, this is uh, one story uh, of, uh, of a young man uh, who told that how uh, he was uh, tortured by two uh, witches from the village. So in his testimony, Marton Balaton from, uh, <coughs> from uh, the village called Iharosberény recalled the story of an extraordinary nocturnal torment that he suffered from two village healers, Erzsébet Hampu and Ilona Palfi. He told that one night, while he was sleeping by his wife's side, in their bed two women drove into the room on a six-horse carriage, which stopped right by the bed. After grabbing him, they meticulously chopped him into pieces. First my two feet, he said, then my lower legs, then my thighs. And so they went on with the rest of my body. The two hid the parts of Marton, uh, Balaton's body under the bed and left the house. 
Balaton is stressed that he was half awake during the terrible assault, and as soon as the witches left, he fell asleep. In the morning, he couldn't wake up because his feet and hands were contracted. So here one could see that uh, he, in his story, uh, he recalled what happened to him. But interestingly, uh, and not surprisingly, this procedure was rather similar that how sergeants and barbers treated those who had a different kind of uh, surgical problems and how surgery went uh, those days. So without anesthesiology, so the pain was not uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, diminished uh, uh, in any way. And uh, uh, when one reads uh, uh, a report on how the limbs were amputated, for example, uh, by, by the, 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 the surgeons, it, is, uh, it was described rather similarly that uh, as uh, one's had problems uh, uh, or one was hurt uh, uh, during a battle, for example, and was operated on uh, by uh, the, the sergeants, uh, they imagined uh, it very similarly. Of course, the, uh, the, uh, the body parts were not hidden under <laughs> any kind of bed, but uh, uh, this is uh, something which is quite uh, outstandingly similar to, to the real methods that how surgery was carried out uh, those days. Uh, of course, the, uh, the witches' operations were uh, uh, imaginary operations, and uh, these similarities, uh, or uh, these, uh, or uh, or, uh, or uh, these similarities, one can find also, for example, in miracle narrative, in miracle narratives, when uh, one is telling about that uh, he or she is operated on uh, 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 during a dream by a, a, a healing saint or. Uh, uh, or by a healing god like Asclepius, for example. So these motives, again, these very old motives and very different motives uh, uh, build up a kind of uh, uh, a mix mixture uh, in this story. But let me uh, step a bit back and let me refer uh, to a further story uh, uh, which is uh, uh, rather particular uh, in this area and then in these trials. And this is about another operation. And this is about cutting the heart or tearing the heart out. And uh, there are also not too many, but rather characteristical stories uh, on this uh, uh, rather weird uh, event. And uh, let me tell you another story, which is uh, uh, from the Croatian-Hungarian uh, border from one uh, town called Legrad, which is now in Croatia uh, by the river Drava. And uh, this was told uh, about one witness, uh, uh, Mrs. Katalin Habun, she is called. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the story stems from a trial in uh, 1743. And uh, this, was, uh, this trial was against a midwife, uh, a very old midwife uh, uh, from this uh, town called uh, Mrs. Janos Verban or uh, Katalin Babi. And uh, she was the accused of uh, bewitching those whom she got angry by uh, tearing their hearts out. So this was her reputation. So according to her story, uh, Mrs. Verban requested uh, her uh, some cheese on credit. She bargained and eventually she got it. Katalin Hobbon's 10-year-old son witnessed the cheese business and commented, Mother, why did you give credit to this old hag, this devil's mother? Mrs. Verban must have been far away by then. Yet she became aware of the boy's offensive words. At least Katalin Hobbon assumed this on the basis that her son suddenly fainted, and when he regained his consciousness, he complained, crying that his heart is being torn apart and gnawed by something. The mother was off to relieve her son's sufferings and found the appropriate remedy at the alleged witch's household. She stole a handful of straw from Mrs. Verban's roof 
and smoked the boy with it. The fact that as soon as the procedure ended, the boy got immediately better clearly meant that Mrs. Verban was the culprit. So let me recall another story here because uh, Mrs. Verban, not, uh, uh, she had not only this victim, but another one as well. So uh, in another case, Mrs. Verban asked for money from a certain Janos Vugrincic, but he refused her. Soon after the incident, Vugrincic fell seriously ill. He spread in the neighborhood that his heart was taken out by the evil midwife. Some who learned Vugrincic's accusation remembered that the midwife kept the man's heart in a bulrush pouch at her house for a couple of days. In vain, Vugrincic sent his servant there to ask for his heart. She replied that if the servant came earlier, she might have given the heart back, but she had already passed it on to another witch. By the time the servant arrived home, his master died. The motive of the witch robbing or tearing a heart rarely occurs in the documents of the Hungarian witch trials, as I said. There are only three further instances known from the whole area where the witch trials uh, <coughs> took, uh, took place. And uh, one is from Transylvania, when the corpse of a child was unearthed in a garden uh, in a town and the heart had been obviously cut out and a healer and seer woman serving a noble lady was suspected of, uh, suspected of the crime. And there is another uh, case uh, from Western Hungary, when a witness told that one night she saw a woman and her daughter entering her room, and they were kneeling by her bed, and they tried to drag her heart out of her breast with their clothes. And a very similar story was also found in the uh, northern Hungary, uh, where also two ladies uh, entered into a room of another woman and they were threatening her that they wanted to tear her heart out. And uh, there are further, further very interesting cases from Croatia, from the Croatian witch trials. In, in a case from Turopolje, a certain Magdalena Kalopjanka from the Dragonojets was detained, tortured, and then confessed that she and uh, the other witches kidnapped an eight-year-old boy. They dissected his heart and then ate it under the cross standing at the middle by the village of Mlaka. And in another case near Osijek, the young Ancica Paukovic, a probably Serbian wo woman from the Slavonian village of Čepin, was imprisoned in Osijek and after more than six months in captivity and several rounds of heavy torture, she confessed that she indeed tore out of the heart of several children with her teeth, and then she passed the heart on a certain Yojo, who was her devil lover. So these stories reveal that the witches could even uh, uh, make uh, operations on, on the human heart and could drag out uh, the people's heart. So uh, let me return uh, to this list and uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, apart from the, uh, uh, this uh, physical proximity, uh, there are some other ways how witches could bewitch people. And on the one hand, it was uh, also firmly believed, believed that witches could turn uh, people into horses and could ride them. And uh, there is also a common explanation in these uh, trials that uh, uh, not only witches, uh, as I said, but uh, some other supernatural beings like fairies uh, could also um, bewitch people. And uh, this is a rather common way of bewitchment. Uh, and this is a rather common explanation that uh, if someone steps into the fair women's bowl, then someone uh, uh, gets an illness. So let me just recall, uh, lastly, this one story. Uh, <coughs> in the village of Dutch, which is in Tolna County in 1743, Janusz Kovács had the suspicion that his sick daughter was bewitched. He called for two healers to his house. 
a local healer woman who was famous of her herbal bath, and a certain Tomás Galagonya, a Moravian itinerant healer who was renowned as a Taltos from the neighboring village of Pataj. The healer woman accused him, I mean Tomás Galagonya of bewitchment, while the healer refused it and declared and the illness was caused by the fair women, which is called Szépasszonyok in Hungarian, because the girl must have stepped into their bowl. Uh, there is another story uh, from Tolna Némedi. Uh, a couple of years later it happened, uh, when the whole village knew that uh, there is a 10-year-old son of the local bootmaker called Fabian, who had been bedridden for months. The parents were convinced that he got ill because the witches carried him away to their feast several times turned and turned him into a horse and rode him until he got exhausted. The mother asked a well-known Orvosasszony, a healer woman, a certain Mrs. Guyash, to treat her son. Mrs. Guyash was unsure whether the illness was caused by witchcraft and suggested that a so-called life or death bath should be prepared in order to identify the real cause. After the bath, she declared that the boy's illness was not the witch's deed, but it was sent by the fair women. She also added that the boy will soon recover because he stepped into their bowl only halfway. It means that he did not entirely step in but somehow stopped halfway between stepping and not stepping. And uh, this was his luck because uh, he could recover uh, from his illness. So uh, uh, these were the most common causations uh, uh, related to witches for the illnesses. Of course, apart for, uh, from these causations, one could find two further causes or two further explanations, although there were uh, not so common in the witch trials. And one is the, uh, another supernatural explanation. And this is that God can send illness on people because of, uh, 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 as a punishment uh, for uh, the people's sin. And uh, the other explanation was that illness had, uh, had a natural cause. So even people who believed in witchcraft they also tend to explain their illnesses according to their empirical knowledge. For example, uh, if someone cut uh, uh, one's finger or if someone had a stomach ache and if, uh, and if someone knew that uh, before that stomach ache, he or she ate something which was not really tasty or rotten or anything, then they, of course, did not think that it was the reason for witchcraft uh, um, and that it was co or it was caused by witchcraft. Um, uh, this is uh, certainly that these explanatory models, uh, these explanations, these uh, parallelly existing explanations uh, were chosen according to the very situation where and how the illness appeared. And uh, it uh, depended very much on the symptom uh, of the illness, that how it was uh, explained. Uh, so if the symptoms, for example, appeared very suddenly without any kind of uh, logical, normal, natural, or this godly supernatural cause, then people thought that it could be the reason of another supernatural cause, and the reason could be bewitchment then. Um, but uh, certainly um, it required a certain kind of mental disposition and a certain kind of uh, uh, psychological, a general psychological context when uh, the probability of uh, uh, bewitchment was somehow higher and uh, we, uh, that, uh, that uh, this explanation was somehow in the air uh, and this was one of the reasons why people tend to explain certain things according to this. On the other hand, very often uh, these witch trials uh, enumerate uh, uh, cases of bewitchment, uh, but uh, these stories uh, are uh, constructed 
retrospectively. So first they have uh, the explanation and then the story is created according to this explanation because the people were expected to prove in front of the court that uh, this uh, deed was a crime and as witchcraft was one particular uh, 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 one particular crime then they were expected to to explain it to the judges that how this uh, occurred and uh, and how this illness uh, was very malevolently caused by someone and not just came out of the blue but now let's turn to the symptoms uh, of uh, 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 bewitchment very shortly so the most common symptom was fever uh, and the other very common symptom was lameness palsy or crippling uh, as we could see in the first story the cold shivers uh, was possible to se send upon someone uh, but fever itself uh, was of course quite a threatening uh, event when it went uh, suddenly very high and of course lameness and also crippling which uh, appeared suddenly and unexpectedly it was again something which was very visible uh, very uh, uh, very uh, uh, pregnant uh, very de decisive uh, uh, sensation and uh, and uh, very uh, and uh, there were uh, very often no explanations uh, uh, at hand yeah. uh, then the loss of senses uh, which was also uh, con very often connected to uh, uh, to witchcraft and then when something swell uh, uh, very very suddenly very unexpectedly and again as i refer to it the different kind of symptoms on on the skin these patches and ulcers and whatever lesions and unexpected pain again can be the symptom of bewitchment and finally uh, when someone had a uh, uh, a constant fear, a con constant mental disposition, either melancholy or uh, a constant uh, fear or threat uh, or the, the feeling of being uh, threatened, then it was also very commonly explained by be bewitchment. On the other hand, there were certain periods in the, in the human life where all these uh, 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 um, let's say psychological uh, dispositions uh, were uh, were more um, more probably to occur, and these uh, these periods uh, of of one's life are the transitory period because uh, from one social stance one uh, trans uh, transits to another social uh, uh, stance. So these are uh, what are called in the, in the anthropological literature, the rites of passage, uh, the periods of passage from, from one, <laughs> one uh, uh, um, as I said, one social stand, one, one state to another one. And birth, marriage and death and all these uh, events around it are especially dangerous, uh, were considered dangerous. And this was uh, those uh, times and those situations when, when, the, the, when the supernatural uh, became somehow or drew somehow closer to the, to the normal uh, human environment. And uh, this was one of the reasons, and this is why I highlighted birth, for example, here, because uh, many of these bewitchment cases are related to the, uh, to the to the human birth to the uh, and this is why there are so many midwives uh, uh, among the uh, among the witches so uh, just uh, before turning to the last section i would also uh, very quickly enumerate that how the therapies and how the medicaments uh, could be grouped so the first and foremost therapy against bewitchment was to identify the witch this was something which we could see in this uh, in these stories either to identify the witch by summoning uh, uh, the witch to the house uh, of the of the of the victim and then the witch would reveal uh, herself or to send a certain kind of illness back to the witch 
and then when the witch is hurt or when the witch uh, gets ill, then this is a visible proof that she was the one who committed the crime. And uh, there are several divinatory baths and uh, uh, and this is also connected to the to the generally applied baths and uh, and and uh, and the, the different kind of uh, uh, um, uh, washing the the people, uh, which are also could be part of this identification or identifying processes. Then there are other therapies also applied against uh, the the causes uh, or, or the or the symptoms uh, of uh, of bewitchment but they are also applied to different kind of illnesses as well so they are not uh, bewitchment specific therapies these are all the therapies that can be found in this uh, in the witch trials but they were also very often applied applied uh, against uh, the symptoms caused by a witchcraft. So there is not a different, uh, a, a particular correlation uh, as, as you can see it. But uh, I highlighted uh, the identifying process, which is only connected to, to, uh, to, the, to this uh, uh, witchcraft explanation. And uh, when the identification is uh, successful and the witch reveals herself, then it is basically a halfway to the uh, to healing uh, as well. Um, at this point, I do not have too much time to talk about benediction exorc and exorcism, although I highlighted it, but perhaps later I will elaborate on it if uh, there is a question in connected to that. Uh, 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 let me just show you that uh, even in the contemporary uh, uh, handbooks on, uh, on midwifery, bathing is one of the the emblems of the midwife so it appears in in uh, in several of these manuscripts uh, where the midwives are depicted even though these manuscripts that i found these depictions are from the 16th century but even from uh, from the 17th and 18th century depictions this is one of the most important features of the of the midwives that uh, that they they uh, they they wash the newborn baby they they use different kind of baths to soothe the pain of the uh, of the the uh, the woman giving birth or uh, after the labor so this was the midwife's uh, basic task and uh, this is why it is not a not incidental that uh, there are so many uh, uh, baths are uh, uh, recalled in these bewitchment narratives in connection with the midwives and uh, very often the midwives were also healers uh, at the same time but they they very uh, um, frequently applied uh, uh, the washing or the bathing uh, of the patient so in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. I don't know, uh, we have a few minutes for questions, but uh, we, can, uh, we can also do it uh, uh, right after the, um, this session or the, in the beginning of the next session. But uh, I will also give you uh, uh, some, some break if you, <laughs> if you need it as well. So thank you very much. And, uh, um, thank you, Judith, for this fascinating lecture. I stopped recording, so if anyone yes. would like to ask uh, 